So we're here to talk about the great books of the Western world. Now you've been running a great books discussion circle in your academy since its inception, actually, since mm -hmm. the inception of the academy, that is not the great book series. Mm -hmm. And it's been very successful and uh, much loved. And I've been a part of it, in fact, since it's inception. Yeah. So we decided to talk today about the great books. Let's get straight to it in that case. What is the great book series? Who put it together? And why did they put it together? Yeah, the great book series is, uh, well, it's kind of dark and you can't see all the way in the back room, but I have one copy here uh, published by the uh, Britannica and great books collection and also with the University of Chicago uh, press. Uh, and this is a original, the original volume set, as you can maybe see here, is a 54 volume set um, can put together by Mortimer Adler was the editor in chief. He was a very important thinker of, of the earlier part of the 20th century. Uh, and he started out at Columbia University. And I think um, that there, the, the genesis of the idea among the, the younger faculty at the University of at Columbia University, like towards the end of World War I, was somehow that, I guess, education had changed. And whereas before, everybody getting a proper education would have been exposed to a certain number of texts throughout their education, but they would find that that was not the case, even to people who were admitted to a, you know, a really good university. So they wanted to give that to what they were going to call a core curriculum of uh, making all the students that came there go through this as you know, it's a series of reading and discussion courses or seminars. Um, so it was developed there at Columbia. It moved to Chicago. Um, it's been embraced by various universities around the United States, as far as I know, uh, mainly. I don't know how much it's, it's spread to other countries, but we have people like uh, you. We've had Australians. We've had British people. We've had people from around the world who know about it and are interested in it. Um, there's a um, a number of universities uh, called St. John's University. It's the same university, but there's one in Annapolis, Maryland, and one in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But that's all they do. The entire curriculum is, is reading these books. But I think, sadly, for somebody who loves them the way I do, um, it's sort of, th this was published, I think, in 1954. It had been again, germinating for about 30 years, but it took a long time to make the selection and and and, and publish the, the, the collection. Uh, and uh, I think it sort of was popular, most, you know, Probably was a new thing. People were interested in trying it in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Uh, I know a lot of people are still interested in it, but I think it's sort of uh, probably on its way out of more institutions than it's on its way in, unfortunately. So it was originally conceived as something for the universities. But I also understand it's had a reach beyond that. It was published by Encyclopedia Britannica and has been one of those sorts of sets that, from what I understand, in America at least, it's a set that a lot of people have but have never opened um, mm -hmm. in broader culture. Was it something that was widely taken up by those people who wish to become, for example, well-read? Uh, I have seen some vintage uh, interviews with Mortimer Adler himself, like 1950s, where he's talking about this being, it, it's published in a sense, you know, the idea of this being for university core curriculum, but you can't cover the content. They're, they're full volumes. Again, if I, maybe you could show them the back of my room that, you know, it covers a very, very long shelf. I mean, you can't expect to to read and discuss all of that and, and, and digest it uh, in, in, a short period of time. It's really a lifelong project. Uh, and, and ideally too, as, as I'm sure you're experiencing, uh, once you've read some of these volumes, you have better understanding of other volumes. And then you can only imagine if you were to go back and reread something, how many things you would see now with a broader perspective that you weren't able to see when you first read it. So uh, I guess the ideal would be to have a, a, a sort of a canon that yes, you could embrace with both arms that would stay the same for a long time that people could read and reread uh, for greater and greater enrichment and understanding and have as a sort of common basis of discussion. You read it, I read it. There's the assumption that what's going on is called the, the great conversation and the choice of the books. The idea was this book that we're choosing from the 19th century, this was probably, this author definitely read this book that was published in the 18th century. And this 18th century book author definitely is referring back to these classical authors. So in a sense, it's the idea that there's this great conversation going on across the generations. And of course, we can't, we can only listen to the the dead authors, but you know we can't really speak back to them. But we're still listening and then conversing based upon what they what they say. So their thoughts. So um, that's sort of some of the ideas that are behind it. So yes, it was I think uh, out there to be. Um, uh, the idea was to try to popularize it, and I think there was a time in the 1950s still when there was probably you know more of a more of a realm for 
general intellectual crusades, but published encyclopedias of all different types and that kind of things. Um, but um, yeah, I just think that that's a cultural trend that is uh, sadly uh, a thing of the past. So if it's a thing of the past, then surely it's a folly to start a great books dis discussion circle as you have done. So why is it that you've done that? And do you see relevance in these books or do you agree with this trend that they ought to fade away? I like the past. I like the past. I, I, I find the past fascinating. I sort of live uh, diachronically in my brain. I mean, I'm always here functioning in, in, in modern times. But uh, when I say it's a thing of the past, I, to me, that's not a bad word. That's a, that's, a, that's a word of praise to say something is a thing of the past. I think that in the past, and I, we've talked about this in other contexts, I think that in the past, in the time when these books were put together, people's brains, because they read stuff like this, were somehow wider, broader. They could conceive of things. I've given... And in other contexts, some examples of, you know, when you when you pick up some books of say 19th century scholarship, you're just overwhelmed at the you know the the the, the content, the richness of the content, the amount of content, and then you look at the footnotes and the number of different languages and quotations. It was just a breadth of knowledge uh, that the the mind had in the fairly recent past, and so this is the last vestige of that. I mean, so. Far from being an act of folly, this is a, this maybe an act of desperation to keep my mind from getting so narrow, to try to keep my mind and, and the mind of people like you who uh, read these, to keep our minds sort of expanded in that word, way that they were somehow in the past compared to the way they are today. So um, again, I to me, to be safe, that's a thing of the past is a word of praise. But uh, I think sadly, in, in the broader society, there is just, it's just looking at a trend. I think, you know, education is... Not what it should be, you know, not what it was, uh, you know, in many, many ways. And this is just one symptom of it. Perhaps you could give us then a sense of which books are included in this collection. You've talked about the big, uh, the great conversation, mm -hmm. uh, going back to the roots of Western civilization and then tracing that through various canonical works. Of course, not, not everything, uh, mm -hmm. not, even, not everything that could even really be called canonical is included. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a selection. Um, could you perhaps take us back to the beginning? and walk us through some of the key selections um, and why it is that somebody might be interested in in reading those books. Sure. Um, so again, my understanding is uh, that historically speaking, I don't know why Adler and a couple of the peoples who were leading lights in this moved from Columbia to Chicago when I did. I think there was a president of the University of Chicago at that time. Hutchins was very, very interested in fostering this project. So he probably said, come here, I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll bankroll the um, the probably this the select probably this project I imagine I'll bankroll the selection of of fifty or so volumes and we will guarantee that it's like widely published and widely made available. So based on that, I think it really did take several uh, decades, and there's the you know the whole editorial board of people who are involved in in choosing these texts, uh, you know, sort of whittling them out, whittling them down, and then also doing something very interesting with them. The first three volumes are um, the, are, are not texts, like this one that I'm holding right now, because we're reading it, volume five is Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, so the Greek dramatists. Um, but the uh, first, uh, well, two of the first three volumes are what are called the great ideas. And so what's interesting, and uh, again, we can talk about why this book is included, not that, wouldn't this be a better book? Might we do that? But the thing is that these books in this series have all been thematically keyed uh, and to an alphabetical index of what they call the great ideas. So um, if you want to, particularly after you've read a number of these volumes, you can go to one of those books and look up an idea such as choose an idea, reincarnation, or or um, or or justice, or or God, or liberty, and you can see and they'll turn to that, and then those will be broken down into different contexts, like you know the uh, justice justice in a democracy, justice under a king, justice for uh, justice for foreigners. It'll be broken down in various categories, and then you'll be told exactly. Oh, this is where uh, this is where uh, Plato talks about that. This is where Tacitus mentions that, gives an example of this. So um, it's uh, a very valuable thing to have that index and be able to go back and say, okay, now we can take the, some of these great ideas and explore again the first mention of them in these texts that were all supposedly seminal in their time and have been read through throughout the time. So, uh, but I know that they had a very hard time choosing these like 50, it's 50 volumes. And so there's multiple authors in some volume, uh, but um, it's basically, you know, getting 
condensing everything that could possibly consider to be a classic into a select few that we're going to make sort of the core. I mean, I, if you're interested in this, you're always going to be stimulated to go out and read more. But to have this be a core that we can be referred back to, lots of people can read the same thing and therefore participate in this great discussion and refer to these idea books and the great ideas. So anyway, um, it's... Uh, I, in my view, um, it's a pretty good selection. If you had to choose some of these things like this, it's kind of Greek heavy, uh, Roman light, um, very light on the Middle Ages, and then pretty strong from the that the 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 from the what we call the Renaissance on the Enlightenment on. Um, it's kind of heavy uh, in uh, in English speaking, or and and, and I think even maybe French uh, authors vis-a-vis -vis other languages. Um, it goes up to Sigmund Freud. So it's about a uh, hundred years. Uh, I think he died in 1939. So it's about uh, going on like 85 years since the death of the last author. But that's interesting because who would have been alive when they uh, were compiling it? And that seems to break a principle to say, you know, how do you know if it's a classic if the guy's not even dead yet? But anyway, yes, um, it starts out uh, with uh, some Greek uh, Greek. Um, fiction or literature. We start with Homer, and then the volume I'm holding in my hands is the Greek playwrights. That's my thing we're looking at these days. Um, there's also um, there's also Virgil from classical antiquity, but that's about it. Uh, there's not much uh, just for the sake of, of keeping the time of, of, of having, you know, a, a limited selection uh, for um, it's kind of broken into a number of themes. So we have literature or belles lettres, and then there's philosophy, then there's uh, math and science, um, and then there is, uh, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. So uh, yeah, so we go from uh, some of the ancient Greeks, which um, we have, they start with the literature, you know, sort of, it's pretty chronological, the selection, uh, as well as historical, um, but it's also somewhat um, thematic. And I thought it better for our group to start by reading all the historical books from ancient times, because I thought probably most of you would not have had much background in that. And when you read some of like these Greek dramas and you don't know anything about this society, the behavior of the people is pretty inexplicable. But if you understand something about the society, you understand the context and you know why they're acting the way they are. So um, I had us read Herodotus first and then Thucydides. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, Tacitus and Plutarch. So those are the four uh, ancient historical books that uh, we read. Uh, and then I thought, well, they've got uh, Homer. We're gonna do Homer next after we finish this volume. But I just thought, well, um, just starting in the, um, the, these plays that are shorter uh, is sort of uh, probably an easier way to ease you into the reading of literature now, because what I liked about our group is how you all gelled at the at very first. It was very difficult for you to read history. You didn't know what to focus on, how to look at it, and 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 you learned how to read that kind of book critically and, and analytically. And then when we switched to literature, it was a I knew that would be a slightly different switch too. So I thought, well, better to do shorter things than longer things. And then likewise, I just thought that because we see the web of connections between the the stories the the background of the homeric stories that goes into a lot of these greek tragedies um we uh yeah i think you're going to be better prepared for reading uh reading the iliad which is a long war slog and uh as my son who was going off to read it uh in his great books course uh at college uh was reading that there and he was like what there's just a bunch of people killing each other that i don't know and i, I don't know why i should care about them so but if you know who these people are and you know the context then you would get uh, a lot a lot more out of them. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm excited about, uh, we're going to read uh, Homer and Virgil uh, this year, definitely. Uh, and then we'll move on to the philosophers. So there's Plato and two volumes of Aristotle, uh, and then a volume of the Stoics, Lucretius, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, then they go into Plotinus, uh, and then some of the uh, Christian theologians, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. Um, so that brings us to the sort of antiquity and Middle Ages. Like I said, those are the first 20 volumes, or 21, 22 is also Dante and Chaucer. But after that is all uh, the next 50 volumes are, uh, so the next 50, the, la the last 25 or so volumes are the past 500 years, and the first 25 volumes are uh, the sort of from 800 BC to uh, to about 1500. Um so yeah, uh, we will in, in the near future. Uh, we're going to do the uh, the philosophers, 
And then that leaves the scientists and I'm and the mathematicians and I'm kind of, um, that'll be interesting to get to those because those are hard and uh, abstruse things. And uh, but by the time we're, uh, we've, cut, we've made our way through some dense uh, philosophy and theology, I think we'll be better able to approach even mathematics. And it's interesting because we've got people in our group who are doctors and the like, who do understand the, the scientific side better. So that, that's good. Um, yeah. Uh, what was your question to what, why would one, one want to read some of these? What, what, what were you asking? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're describing it. Uh, yeah. We've heard these names, Homer and Plato, and you say Dante. I see also here Machiavelli, who didn't mention. Mm -hmm. uh, Shakespeare, two volumes of Shakespeare. Oh, no, no, no. I stopped it. I stopped at the year 1500. I was, oh, uh, yeah. I was taking a historical pause. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm going to want to mention the others. So, yeah, in the 16th and 17th centuries, they put uh, Machiavelli and, and Hobbes. There's uh, two volumes for Shakespeare, uh, one volume for Cervantes. So one of the principles here is that they didn't want to give... Um, they didn't want to give selections. They wanted to give you, if they're going to give you the work, they're going to give you the whole work. So the, I mean, it's not the entire complete works of somebody who has as massive of an output as say Thomas Aquinas, but the things that they have in there are complete works. And for a lot of people, they do endeavor to give you the, you know, the, the complete, the complete works that they have. So uh, with Cervantes, it's not going to be chapters from Don Quixote. It's going to be a translation of the entire Don Quixote. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. You can see they've got in the middle in the in the Enlightenment and the dawn of the scientific era. They've got a lot of scientists. They've got uh, Newton and Huygens uh, in the volume. They've got uh, people who wrote both math and sort of philosophy. They Pascal, and I think they have both kinds of his his writings uh, in there. Um, so yeah, it gets pretty strong on what we would call the liberal tradition of the philosophical tradition of Locke, Berkeley, Hume. Um, it also has uh, Kant uh, for philosophy and modern philosophy and Hegel. Uh, and like I said, it, it, it ends with uh, William James and Sigmund Freud. So psychology is one of the innovations of, of early, sort of the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And before them, there are some of the Russians, the great Russians, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and, you know, just sort of major important classics. So there's there's Darwin, and then there's Marx. So there's the entire Das Kapital, and there's the entire, you know, both of Darwin's major works. And so the idea is that, you know, when you read these things, that a lot of people sort of quote and assume they know and assume they understand, but they haven't ever really gone and read the original, the source, you know, and seen how these arguments are made for, uh, the kind of things that they talk about. So I think that that's thought to be the main value of here is you're going to the source, you're going to the main source of things that have been um, written and and that and respected and and um, you know well read by lots of people. And like I said, I feel that the selection, you know, anybody would have been unhappy with the final selection. You know, they said, well, I could have this person or that person. Why is this person in here? Why did you leave that person out? Um, uh, it is, I think, given the tradition that it comes from, it's understandably sort of heavy in English speaking authors and maybe French people. I think even German speaking authors are slight. They've got Goethe in there, but uh, not much, much else. But um, I, I think that, like I said, it's it's a it's a good, solid core, you know, that one can use and refer back to, particularly with these uh, the two volumes of the great ideas. You've given us now a list, and I suppose. We could go online and find that list of the great books, uh, read them ourselves. What's nothing to stop us from doing that, technically speaking. So why a discussion circle? Why have you designed your discussion circle the way you have done? And what are the benefits of going through a list of, of books like this, the ones you've, you've listed here, in that kind of format? Well, um, I think that it should be included in this set, and it isn't. But uh, Mortimer Adler wrote a book simultaneous with this called how to read a book which you know sounds like a, a title that you could spoof but it's very serious talking about how there are different types of books out there and most of the reading that most most people do is either just for entertainment or pure information so you're reading a news article and you know what's going on you're reading a story about something familiar to you or just reading to to be entertained but when you're reading for analysis when you're reading for understanding when you're reading to so to challenge yourself when you're reading to learn from something that you don't know, you don't understand, you have to read in different ways. And so he's got a book called uh, How to How to Read a Book that 
um, explains that. And in that and everywhere, and just as the in the universities, I mean, these are hard, confusing texts sometimes. These are things that no matter how well educated you are and how, you know, how big a frame of reference you have, this is like stuff that um, you you could, you know, you need to not just read it, you need to sort of articulate it and think, is that what it means? And it's really helpful if you're doing that with a group of people and you're all doing that and you're bouncing it uh, off each other. So uh, that's always been part of the project of uh, the great books from uh, from Adler and and all that. There's always been the idea of great book circles and that's why they're taught as college core curriculum courses or college courses. So you're in a small seminar. Uh, and like I said, I, I went through a lot of these myself and um, I was sometimes I, when I think back, I was probably too young to really appreciate them all I did, but I was obviously very influenced by them. Uh, and so I just um, have had various opportunities in my career as a university professor, particularly uh, the university in, in Lebanon, where I was um, making a core curriculum based exactly around these texts and doing that. Um, but uh, it's just always been integral to me and who I am and, and what I do. So it just seemed uh, natural. And we are not, we can't see each other around the seminar table, but I feel like that's what we're kind of doing in our Zoom classroom. So um, talking about it with uh, other people is uh, things. These are, these, again, these are not books that you're going to like just pick up and easily read the way you hold a book and, and read a storybook or a, a, a factual book of, of something that you already have information and context for. So um, it really helps to uh, have discussions uh, about them. So um, try to use the Socratic method, not like, you know, I, I've read these, a lot of these before. I've got more background in them than you do, but I'm learning from them just as much as you are. And so I'm not like there to say, well, here's the, here's the answer. This is here. I'm just sort of asking probing questions questions and inviting you to ask probing questions and make probing observations as your own on your own. So it's uh, just infinitely more fruitful to put um, several like-minded minds who are chewing over these very difficult ideas from minds of the past together to try to make sense of them. Yes. And if I reflect on my own participation in the class, as well as I think of the others in the class, you know, we have a range of people there. Some people are academics such as yourself or academics in training, perhaps. Um, others are uh, working in various different jobs of all types and retired people, uh, college students, you know, there's no particular through line other than I think a shared curiosity. So there's, there's a diversity there. And I think that's actually, that's actually a real strength. Going mm -hmm. through in a discussion format, I think I've noticed has several advantages. Number one, we have a set reading each week. So there's actually a building of capacity. There's something, you know, yeah, we have a list of these books and sure I could read them, but there's something about having a set reading each week, a certain amount that one simply has to get done that week. And it's not, it's very manageable, but nonetheless, as the weeks and months go by, what well, we find, we've gone through Herodotus, we've gone through Thucydides, we've completed Plutarch. Well, at least our first attempt and Tacitus too. And so, you get through it. And then the capacity to read that difficult material grows. And as you said, many of us at the beginning struggle to understand what was being read. Different, there are different backgrounds in terms of reading a level, but within uh, short weeks, I think everyone was really up to speed. And that in itself, regardless of what we're reading, is a great benefit. Mm -hmm. And there's an, there's an analytical component also, which I think aids the understanding. When you know that you're reading and you're going to be discussing it in a group. You read it differently. You read it with a view to discussing it with others. You engage with it in a different way. And then when you, so there's an analytical skill. And then when we come to the group and we discuss it together, there are discussion skills uh, developed. We're growing the ability to express ideas and in dialogue with people who might agree or disagree. And that whole process of reading, digesting, and then outputting in that sense. Um, I think it aids the understanding and it makes the text so much richer and, 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 and go in so much deeper. Well, that's then you're fulfilling my hopes. That was the the aspiration. Like I said, when I when I did this as a core curriculum when I was 18 years old, I mean, I, I wanted to do it. I went there to, to do it. But uh, 
yeah, I think 18 is, you know, different levels of maturity, you know, you were getting something out of it, but I don't think, uh, you know, I think that it is, you know, a, a lifelong learning project. So it's welcome to have college students, but, you know, that's sort of the the first read. They're lucky because they are going to live long enough to probably to read these three or four times if they start now. So um, it's, it's good to have that, but um, if you come to it with greater, yeah, like I said, once, once I, I have read, Many, if not most of these, uh, but not all of them, and many, so many of the ones that I have read, it's been since my, uh, my the time that I did this. Uh, a lot of them are more recent, but um, it's, yeah, uh, just sort of facilitating people who like you, who really appreciate it, who, for whatever reason, haven't done it before, haven't had an opportunity before. That's It's incredibly rewarding because, like I say, this, this kind of... <clears throat> This kind of idea, this kind of project has always been near and dear to my heart. I've always been a voracious reader. And, you know, I, I don't remember specifically if I was aware of this already when I was in high school as, as, a, as a project, but I loved going to the library and, you know, seeing encyclopedic collections and stuff like that and, uh, and working with that. So, um, yeah, I've sort of just have this in my blood uh, and I've been doing it, you know, for forever it feels like in terms of my own sort of reading project and, and assignments for reading to myself from from the time i was an adolescent i was very interested in a lot of things and in, in, in philosophy and you know and in and in good literature and things like that so um to help other people become open to that and appreciate that and become enriched by it is incredibly rewarding rewarding so uh, that's why i said like I'm, I'm very glad we've got such a wide variety of people already uh but then to and like just to have their different perspectives play into this. I think it is very enriching for everybody who's involved there. And yes, that wide array of people uh, fosters a sort of collaboration, I think. Uh, it's not a college classroom. The, 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 the sorts of experiences and voices in the class are certainly much broader than one would find in the average college classroom. And I'm constantly surprised by the insights and perspectives that come up in the class and they're not always what one would expect. And I think that's very interesting. There's also this theme of lifelong learning that you're very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And in particular, learning, well, maybe we could talk about that broad, more broadly, but in particular, this idea of becoming well read, there's this idea of becoming well read. And it's something I noticed a lot of people in the class uh, express as their motivate, one of the key motivations for them joining the class, they'd say things like, I want to become well read, I want to read these, I never I also heard, I'm thinking of one person uh, say, I never got to read these. And mm -hmm. the person has this sense that they ought to have, that there's something there that's theirs in some way that they, they weren't given access to by just the way they're educated or, you know, whatever the case is, they, they feel some sort of connection to these books that they've never read, which is an odd thing in a way. So what is that, this idea, this yearning that people have to read this particular well, what, what the sorts of books that this collection at least represents, if not encompasses entirely? Yeah, there are a lot of people like that out there. I know that there are. And uh, I, I think that um, maybe people who have been wanting to do this for a long time, that's why they probably sold so many copies of this that, again, you can pick up at, at church yard sales or something for very cheap. And they're, they're old, they're, they're sort of dented here, but you, they're clearly they've never been read before. They've never been opened before. The plans very stick. So. These are intimidating. These are hard reads. People hear about them and they think, well, these are important works. They hear them referenced and they think, oh, I should read this. But um, it's just a very hard thing to do on your own. So if nothing else, just having some sort of group to go to every week on a weekly basis gives an accountability. And you have a specific assignment that you are supposed to read and everybody else is doing that. And if you're prepared in that, then you can participate in the discussion and you can really feel the <clears throat> The benefits of doing this kind of reading and if you uh, stick it out as as you and and the core group and the core group have have done for the past year and a half then you start to build this wider and wider frame of reference that does as you put it sort of answer this itch that i think a lot of us uh, even if we've got good educations just you know we're not really put in direction to read and digest books that would expand your mind and sort of take us out of the present and put us into a broader context of 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 thought um and so it's just uh it's it is um I've, I've stressed this in, in many regards it's it's an intellectual project but it's also a um 
I would say a spiritual project. It's a project of mental mind expansion. On that very note, although I mentioned here, somebody who's watching the last night wondered, why isn't the Bible in here? They, they assumed that people would know the Bible. The Bible is referenced to the um, to, in the book of great ideas. But uh, there's there's some theology in here. But apart from reading theology specific, I think that the project of expanding your mind beyond the horizons that you're given is an inherently spiritual project. So this is an intellectual and, and spiritual growth project, I think. Of, of just expanding your horizons and your understanding. And um, that's something that, you know, I think a lot of people like to, would want to embark on that or think maybe they're trying to embark on that or hope that they're embarked upon that. But that's obviously a, a very long, difficult, lifelong project to continually sort of improve your self mentally and, and, and spiritually and um, having a group that gives you accountability and and camaraderie and and again those other minds to bounce things off i think is um is very rewarding i'm you know i'm as appreciative of of you truly as as the others i'm not i might be you know i organized it i lead it i've got more experience i you know i get i set the ball rolling but uh, every single session is is a learning experience for me as well so it's a, it's a very very i know what it's like to be there i know how rewarding it is yes and that uh, to follow on from that point there is something special about having someone like you who has a lifetime of not only formal education to a high very high level but also a lifetime of autodidactic learning and curiosity and passion in these subjects we said, well, why don't you just read them yourselves? Yeah, well, you know, people could read them themselves, but we've mentioned the benefits of being in a circle like this. But also, well, why not just get a bunch of friends together? Yeah, you could do that too. But there is something useful about having someone such as yourself to guide the circle, um, to contextualize certain things, to uh, engage the group in a Socratic way, to explain and buttress uh, difficult areas where necessary, but whilst at the same time you're able to step back and allow discussion to flourish if it's not needed. So that kind of uh, element, I think, is also very important in this particular circle and worth mentioning. Mm, well, I'm I'm flattered to hear that. Thank you very much. It's 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 a privilege and a pleasure to lead it because I mean, there's a lot of uh, intelligence and education uh, in in the group of of all sorts of types too. So it's uh, it's 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 a very good feeling. As you know, my background is in music, and one of the principles in music is to follow a trail back uh, historically of a certain influence. So you might be, for example, impressed by a guitar player like Eddie Van Halen, let's say, and you think, oh, I want to play like Eddie Van Halen. And so you copy Eddie Van Halen. And, and of course, that's a great thing to do in developing your musical voice. But it's quite easy to become an Eddie Van Halen clone. Well, actually, it's not that easy because he's such a genius. But anyway, but then you might say, oh, hang on. Eddie Van Halen was really passionate about Eric Clapton. And he, he used to play Eric Clapton solos verbatim, so to speak, when he was learning. I need to start. Let me go to Eric Clapton. And then you start to and you start to see where some of those aspects of, say, Eddie Van Halen. Style, and then you say, oh, who did? Eric Clapton listened to it. Then, oh, then you start to look at the, you know, B.B. King or Robert Johnson, and you start to go back like this. And the further back you go, you realize that each of those people I've mentioned, in a certain sense, draws upon the influences of the past to create their own unique situation, but they don't draw on all of it. Mm -hmm. And you can go back there and you start to immerse in the source of where these threads of inspiration come from. It's very interesting. And I think one thing I've noticed for myself, going back to some of these older books that are so thoroughly like it's referenced or have been anyway thoroughly read through the trajectory of the history of intellectual thought in the west it recontextualizes everything you see ah i see where that came from and oh i see what they've how they've arrived at that place and then it helps me network my thinking in, mm -hmm. a, in a totally different way and it helps me uh, in a certain sense take a greater, um, it positions me rather, mm -hmm. uh, to think differently, even about today's issues and even about the sorts of intellectual subjects that I might be interested in by going back to those sources. It's uh, extremely enriching in that sense too. I think there's something there in reading the great books or collections like it. 
Well, obviously, I, I, I could not concur more, and uh, I have always really enjoyed that, uh, not only going back to origins in terms of ideas, but let's not forget that these books are, you know, they're written, they're all, we're reading them all in English translation, but uh, trying to go even further and read them in the original uh, and see how these ideas are expressed as they were actually expressed, that's even taking it to another level. That's always driven my desire to learn languages the way that I do, and then not only learning languages to read literature, but then learning languages to learn about the origin of languages. Where do the words come from that we use? What then the words that are used in here? So the ideas and the words. So that quest for origins is, you know, just an integral part of of whatever drives me as 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 a as a, as a person. Um, but uh yeah, I just think that the ability to see networks and connections and relationships and how things are connected to how they grow from each other and come from each other. That's when you don't know that, I always feel very limited and stulted and just the the degree that you know that you can almost see the the world as as a this sort of frame in front of you that's being slowly filled in as somebody weaves a tapestry and you can see the threads connecting and you can slowly see the pictures coming out. And you know, before you just you know, maybe saw the frame or just the some lines going across, but then the thing gets filled in as a beautiful picture. Yes, indeed. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for talking about the great books uh, and your discussion circle uh, with me today. What should we say here to end? Maybe you could say a little bit about the circle once again, how to find it, how to join it, um, what's going to happen when someone joins it, what will their experience be uh, right now? We're uh, not finished yet, but we're working through the Greek dramatists, as you as you pointed out. We're, we're at Euripides right now, and soon to go to Aristophanes, and then from there we're, we're going on to Homer, I believe. And so, what? Uh, this is a great time to join. In fact, mm -hmm. I would say. So, could you say something a little bit uh, in that sense about the circle, how to join it, and so on? I think that a, a lot of people are interested in joining a circle like this, but somehow have the idea that they need to start at the very beginning, or at least the beginning of a book. And obviously, that's that's nice and 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 good. And there are times we can let people know, try to have that posted. You know, we'll be starting Homer in February or something like that. But um, given the nature of the project, it's it's really not necessary. You're never going to read all of these books. You're always going to be, be in the middle of reading something. And so, um, and particularly with the dramas that we're reading right now, because they're so short, you know, anybody could join if you come one day. We're not in the middle of one play. We're going to be reading a, another play. So there's nothing impeding anybody joining right now because we're in the dramas and then we'll be starting Homer. So um, yeah, it's just a question of, you know, I, I think that what what we see in our group is, you know, there really is a group cohesion. Uh, and I think that, you know, we can invite people to come and see what it's like, you know, and then, and, you know, make sort of decide if they want to commit and roll paid, you know, join, you know, because once they, once they join it, we do develop a camaraderie and it is kind of uh, disruptive and sad when people don't come and then we don't have these people here because we're expecting to have a, a full, rich conversation. So um, I would say that, you know, people ought to look at that and say, well, you know, because, yeah, as you put, we, we've we learned how to read. Uh, there's a certain amount of reading that you have to do each week. And if you think, well, I can handle that amount of reading each week and I can commit to going, you know, on a, on a weekly basis and I can... Um, commit to you know just getting myself the accountability that i'll need to keep reading by doing that then then anybody would be welcome and like you said we've got um we we've got college students we've got retired people we've got people from all sorts of careers who have been in the group at various times and so um i would be open to having anybody who's interested in in, in the project uh, come see what it's like and see if they can make that commitment to themselves first of course can i do this amount of reading can i uh, can i come on a regular basis and 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 get this enrichment and share my thinking with the others and that would be a, a good thing to do i mean we're putting this on my channel, I guess. Uh, and, you know, there's always a link to my website, the Academy, and there's all the information anybody would need to like find out how to sign up and, and join there if they're interested. 